قالوا سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم now before we go to actually respiratory failure and other pathophysiological problems of lung i'll just quickly go through the basic subject of what the lung is and what are the anatomical facts and what are the physiological facts of the lung now anatomically there are two lungs one is right lung other is the left lung and there are five lobes three lobes on the right side and two lobes on the left side and every lung has got its segments there are 19 segments 10 segments on the right side and nine segments on the left side and then If you look at the blood supply of the lung it's uh, by the bronchial arteries and by pulmonary arteries and the bronchial arteries bring the oxygenated blood to the lung and the pulmonary artery bring the venous blood to the lung also because it is called artery because it is going away from the heart that's why it is labeled as artery although it has got venous blood in it now pulmonary arteries supply up to the uh, respiratory bronchioles up to the upper edge of respiratory bronchioles then the bronchial arteries supply up to the upper end of the respiratory bronchioles and then the pulmonary arteries then the venous blood goes through the pulmonary veins there are four pulmonary veins which drain into the left atria and these pulmonary arteries go into uh, sorry bronchial arteries uh, they become the capillaries then they on the right side and on the left side is i goes vein and hemi is i goes veins so they drain into the spheroid vena cava so this is the blood supply of the heart but as far as the nerve supply is concerned so there is a pulmonary plexus at hilum and it is sympathetic and parasympathetic parasympathetic is by the vagus and sympathetic is by the sympathetic nerves which are coming there now what does the sympathetic nervous system do it causes vasoconstriction of the vessels of the lung and it causes bronchodilatation of the uh, smooth muscles of the lung then it also suppresses the secretions when you stimulate the parasympathetic system it causes vasodilatation but bronchospasm those cholinergic fibers and they increase the secretions is it is a, a physiological effects and in every lung if histologically if you look at it there are about 23 generation of the lungs <coughs> you've got trachea then bronchi then bronchiole then then goes and goes on there are uh, 23 generation up to 16 generation then the respiratory bronchiole comes so up to 16 generation it is a conducting pathway from 16 generation onward there it is a respiratory pathway they where the gases exchange takes place from respiratory bronchial then you go to the alveolar duct then alveolar sac then alveoli there are about 300 million alveoli in both the lungs 300 million alveoli in both the lungs and if you calculate the surface area of alveoli in both the lung it's about 17 square million 70 square meters 70 square meter it's a very big area so as the blood supply to the alveoli is by the pulmonary arteries so what is the cross sectional area of the pulmonary capillaries it's about the same 70 square meter because the ventilation and perfusion should match each other so 70 square is the surface area of the alveoli and the cross sectional area of the pulmonary capillary is 70 square meter that's why the ventilation perfusion ratio is kept constant so there are 23 generations remember that as far as the lung function is concerned there are two types of function respiratory function and non respiratory function 
we always ignore non respiratory function we always think about it that gases are going into the lung oxygen is going into the blood and going to the tissue and carbon dioxide is coming out this is uh, also this is a major work of the lung but there are 40 types of uh, cells in the lung and they do different functions and they are also very important now this respiratory function is carried out by uh, out of 40, there are one type of cell is called pneumocytes, type 1 cell. And the pneumocytes surface area is about 95 uh, percent area is occurred by the pneumocytes because the maximum gas passes through the pneumocytes and comes back, carbon dioxide comes back. Only 5 percent is occupied by the type 2 cells. They produce surfactant. So, although the bulk, if you look at the bulk of the cells, bulk of the cells of type 1 cell is about 40 percent and the bulk of type 2 cell is of uh, 60 percent. But if you look at the area, area is occurred by type 1 cell is 95 percent. So it has got logic behind it. This surfactant production and other things is a separate topic. Then you look at the different, looking at the functions, the respiratory functions, respiratory function is, is exchange or diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen goes from the lung into the blood and the carbon dioxide comes from the blood into the lung and expired out. Now this diffusion is in two phases. When you breathe in, it passes through the conducting pathways, then goes up to the alveoli. This is all gaseous media. Here the law which applies, law of diffusion applies is through the gaseous media, which is called Graham's law of diffusion. Because diffusion of gases is inversely proportional to its molecular weight. If you look at the molecular weight of carbon dioxide is 44, and that of oxygen is 32, so oxygen travels faster from nose up to the alveoli than the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide comes very fast into the alveoli because travel, traveling of carbon dioxide and oxygen from the alveoli up to the blood is all in liquid. It is alveolar epithelium, then you got subcutaneous tissue, then you got capillary endothelium, then you got plasma, then it uh, combines with the hemoglobin or is carried away like this or in the plasma. So that is passing through liquid media. Then it follows uh, Henry's law of diffusion. That is the diffusion through the liquid media. So Henry's law of diffusion says that diffusion of gases in liquid media is directly proportional to its solubility coefficient. Any gas which is more soluble passes quickly as compared to the gas which is less soluble. So carbon dioxide is about 200 times more soluble rather more than that 250 times it's more soluble than sorry 24 times more soluble than oxygen diffuses through the liquid media but as the oxygen is moving faster in the gases media if you combine these both laws then it becomes a ratio of 20 to 1 20 to 1 carbon dioxide becomes more diffusible 20 times as compared to oxygen but once the carbon dioxide comes into the alveoli it needs respiratory excursions so that it should be brought out from the alveoli to the air atmosphere. So for that you need ventilation or for that you need the patient to be breathing on his or on her own. Now non-respiratory function, there are multiple non-respiratory function, metabolic function, endocrine function, transformation of biochemical substances, then liquid and solute exchange, then defense mechanism. So we only look at the carbon dioxide and oxygen, but there's multiple functions which the lung has to do. Now there are 40 types, different types of cells in the lung. So there are cells with a specialized function which require extra energy. These pneumocytes, they don't require any energy, but the other cells, they require energy. Now, if you look at the non-respiratory function, metabolic function, oxygen utilization and energy production is one of the functions. Then surfactant synthesis 
is another important function. What is surfactant? So is a surface tension lowering agent. What is surface tension? Can you define what is surface tension? What is the pressure? Mathematically, it follows Dalton's law of partial pressure, but what is pressure? It's a force per unit area. Force per unit area. But surface tension is force per unit length. There's a difference between pressure and the surface tension. So it's a force per unit length is called surface tension. And this surfactant substance lowers the surface tension. So it be, thing becomes expansive. So it, it, the things will be more, will not be rigid because when the baby is born, surfactant starts being produced when the baby is inside the uterus at the age of 22 weeks, 22 to 24 weeks. At the age of 33 to 35 weeks, this acute surge comes in production of babies, uh, production of surfactant. Then at the birth, usually it is released more. That's why when the baby cries, due to negative pressure in the lung, the lung expands. If there is less surface uh, uh, surfactant production, then they have to give surfactant from outside or have to ventilate the patient. That's what happens in the neonatal unit or uh, NICO and PICO. So it's a separate subject, surfactant production. It's a very big subject, but it's a very interesting subject also. Then protein and connective tissue synthesis. That's also part of metabolic function of the lung. Then endocrine functions. It is autocrine function, paracrine function, and neurocrine function. Autocrine function, it is produced by the cells and they are acting on the same cells. There are substances which are produced by the cell, but they are effective on the same cells, it's called autocrine function. And paracrine function, they are produced on the cells, but they act on the surrounding cells. Then neurocrine is, they are produced by the cell, they act on the nerves. So these are the three functions of lung also, autocrine, paracrine, and neurocrine. Then if you look at the endocrine functions, hormone synthesis is the big list. You got ACTH, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, calcitonin, histamine, opiate peptides, serotonin, substance P, VIP, vasoactive, intestinal, polypeptide, all these substances are dealt by the lung. Still some more. If you look at the eicosanoid metabolism, so when the eicosanoid metabolism takes place, so arachidonic acid takes the two pathways, one is cyclooxygenase pathway, other is lipoxygenase pathway. So by cyclooxygenase pathway, the prostaglandin 2, D2, E2, F2 and I2, they are separate topic actually, I have just enumerated over here, then this thromboxin, thromboxin A1, thromboxin A2, they have got different functions on the blood vessels and on the smooth vessel. Then lipoxygenase pathway, they produce leukotrienes, there are multiple leukotrienes, so they cause a constriction of the uh, airways and also cause constriction of the vessels also. So they have got multiple functions, so when the patient goes into respiratory failure, particularly when the patient goes into ARDS, all these cells are stimulated or depressed. So then you get opposing effect also on the body because of release of these substances. So that's why ARDS about 60 to 70 percent mortality and according to the symptomatology we control the patient. There is no definitive treatment that we do this and this will happen. No, because these 40 cells, they d respond differently. That's why this subject is very difficult to treat the patient with ARDS, very difficult. Then transformation of substances takes place in the lung, like acetylcholine, serotonin, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, histamine, it's a big list. Then peptides, you've got a bradykinin. Angiotensin 1, angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2. That only takes place in the lung by enzyme which is called converting enzyme. And other name is kinetase 2. And other name is dipeptidyl carboxypeptidase. So these three names are given to it, but it's only lung. That's why in the lung, if there is a problem in the lung, 
lung fails to produce this converting enzyme so it means an angiotensin system fails there is no production of angiotensin 2 the patient goes into hypotension this is the most important cause of hypotension in a patient who has gone into the ARDS and same is in the liver liver produces angiotensinogen if liver has got liver fails it does not produce angiotensinogen so then this system or renin angiotensin system does cannot start so that is the most important cause of hypotension in a hepatic failure then there are some more adenine nucleotide like atp and amc and other things they are uh, dealt by the lung lungs are as wet as any tissues in the body right it's not dry organ so there is outward filtration of 10 to 20 mls per hour 10 to 20 mls are what is released into the lung through the capillaries but it does not accumulate over there the nature has put baskets of lymphatics every alveola is lying in a basket of lymphatics the richest supply of lymphatics is in the lung and the drain through the lymphatic duct drain into azygous vein and then goes into the venous blood now azygous vein opens into the spirovena cava so if you increase the central venous pressure into the spirovena cava greater pressure than the lymphatics what will happen lymphatics will not be able to drain into it if they cannot drain into it it means there will be accumulation of water in the alveoli and this is the most important cause of resistant pulmonary edema if the patient with the pulmonary edema be put on a ventilator to clear the lung by putting a positive pressure always remember what what is the level of peep you might have put the patient on a higher peep and it is obstructing the lymphatic drainage into it think about it if in spite of putting the patient on a ventilator cannot clear the water from the lung so look at the cvp what is the intravenous pressure you might have put the peep more so you might have reduced the pressure gradient between the lymphatics and the spirovena cava so it's one of the most important cause of resistant pulmonary edema now there is a defense mechanism also by the lung non specific and specific immunological now assessment of lung function as usual for assessment of any organ we take the history of the patient whether the patient has got dyspnea patient has got a cough and patient has sputum nowadays if the patient got dyspnea and the cough says refer to nishtar this is corona this is what is happening so that's why the number of patient has been reduced we we are very afraid of corona and in a dyspnea what is dyspnea dyspnea by definition is when you become conscious of your breathing now when you are sitting here you are breathing but you don't notice that you are breathing have you ever noticed that how many time i am breathing no we go on breathing we are not conscious of breathing when we become conscious of our breathing it means you are dyspneic so that's it the then you calculate the dyspnea index and other things then you do the physical examination in physical examination inspection palpation percussion auscultation go in the same same way but it's a fashion again not to touch the patient it's a very bad thing always even the nurse should have a stethoscope hanging around your neck and there is every hour you put your stethoscope on the chest and see you can find something different you can find even more important finding that than the doctor can find so it is the duty of a nurse who is looking after these critically ill patient that should use the stethoscope all the time then after the even x ray chest we straight away go on go on the ct scan hr ct but before that there is a one step this got x ray chest and clinical examination is very important then the x ray chest is very important also if there is indication that then you go for ct scanning then complete blood picture and then sputum examination so that completes your clinical uh, assessment of the patient 
Now, why we do want to do the sophisticated lung function test? There are three reasons only. One reason is to determine the nature of the pulmonary disorder. Okay, what is the pathology? We should diagnose. What is the problem with the patient? Second thing is to quantitate the degree of impairment. What is the degree of insult on the lung? How deep is the problem? The third is to further understanding of pathophysiology. That's why we take, try to take the help of uh, different tests. In olden days, even now also some of the old pulmonologists, the tests which require no instrumentation like walking test, match test, breath holding test. Have you ever seen it? anybody doing it? They are very important. They give you a lot of information. How long you can walk? What does it make your distance worse or not? Then match. At what distance you can blow your uh, match? You light in the match and then breath holding cell. You take the deep breath in, then hold it. You can see how far, how many seconds so you can hold it. That gives you idea. And you have clinically examined the patient and you have done this test without any instrumentation. Then we come to instruments, measurement of lung volumes, vital capacity by vitalograph. What is vital capacity? Any offer? What is vital capacity? This is a maximum amount of air you can expire out after the maximum inspiration. So that's the vital capacity. And if you timed it, how much is coming out in first second, that is called timed vital capacity, FEV1. It should be 83% of the total vital capacity. It's a very important test in obstructive airway disease, right? Then FEV1, then functional residual capacity. What is functional residual capacity? It is the residual volume plus, it's the amount of air which remains in the lung after the normal tidal volume, after the normal volume we have wondered. So functional residual capacity, the amount of air which remains in the lung in spite of forceful expiration, that is called residual volume. That cannot be taken out. If residual volume and the volume which remains in, that's very important. Then there is another terminology called closing volume. It's the amount of air which remains in the lung above the residual volume and the alveoli starts closing. The amount or the volume of the gas above the residual volume at which the alveoli starts closing is called the closing volume. If the closing volume plus residual volume is called the closing capacity, these are very important tests of the lungs closing volume and closing capacity to calculate that. Then residual volume, it doesn't matter how fast you breathe, doesn't matter how deep you breathe, so it remains in the lung, right? Then TLC, total lung capacity, that is the tidal volume plus inspired reserve volume, expired reserve volume and residual volume. That is the total lung capacity is about 6 liters, 5,900 mils. So then the ratio of FEV1 to FEV, that's about 83%. Right? Then the, you should have another ratio, residual volume divided by total lung capacity. That's also a very important test. So these tests are separate topic actually, lung physiology, but you should remember what are these. Then mechanics of lung. Mechanics of, when we talk about mechanics of lung, you immediately think about two things. One is the compliance of lung, other is the resistance of lung. These are very important tests as far well as breathing and the ventilation is concerned. Now, compliance is nothing, but it is a volume change per unit change in pressure. It shows that if you increase one centimeter of water, pressure inside the lung, how much will be the increase in volume? That's called compliance. Normal compliance is 0.2 liter in an adult. 0.2 liters mean 200 cc of both lungs. What will the compliance of one lung? 0.1 liter. What will the lung of uh, each lobe on the right side? 0.1 divided by 3. Three lobes. There are three lobes on the right side. It will be 0 0.03. 0 0.33. And on the left side there are only two lobes. 0 0.1 divided by 2. 0 0.05. 
Now, what is the compliance of baby? 0.006 mil. But to avoid this confusion in adult and babies, so they made another uh, measurement. This is called specific compliance. Anyway, so this is compliance is another separate topic, and other uh, parameter is the resistance, resistance of lung. Resistance. What is the resistance? According to Ohm's law, resistance is nothing but pressure over flow. Pressure over flow. That how much pressure is generated if you increase the flow? Its Ohm's law is relationship of three things: resistance, pressure, and flow. If you want to calculate one thing, you need to have two parameters. You need to know the two parameters. So resistance is equal to pressure over flow. So this is measured by two, three methods. One is the interrupter method, other is plethysmography, third is Hagen Poiseuille law, and then Ohm's law. These four things, they that's how we measure the resistance of the lung. And every part of the lung, we should know the compliance and resistance of whole lung, then both, both lungs separately, then of every lobe. So then we should know okay, what sort of ventilation, what sort of pressure we should put in to ventilate that particular part of the lung. And it's very important to choose a type of ventilation you are going to give to the patient. Now then measure of, measurement of gas exchanges, which we do straight away. Partial pressure of PO2 or you can write down P small a O2. Partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. Then PCO2. It, is a, it should be written P small a CO2. It means partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood. Then PAA minus, multiplied by the PO2. It means the, it's a difference of partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli and the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. That is called AA gradient. So if you look at the partial pressure in the alveoli, then you look at the partial pressure in the blood, and then the difference, greater the difference, you should be worried about it. There is a normality, there is normally 8 to 10 millimeter mercury. But if it is greater, then you should think about it. There might be some problem with the alveolar capillary pathway. If it is less, it means it's a very good exchange, very good diffusion is taking place. In our blood gas analyzer, we got all the facilities already calculated, otherwise you can calculate yourself also. So always look at the blood gases after deciding whether the acidity or alkalinity, whether it is compensated or uncompensated, and after you have decided, look at the oxygenation status also. Look at the small PaO2, then big PaO2, then look at the A gradient, then you look at another ratio also. So that ratio is very important that partial pressure of oxygen in the artery of blood divided by partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. So that's also important. That tells you again about diffusion of oxygen from the alveoli to the blood. Then closing volume. Closing volume is another test which is done. It's a very important parameter to assess the function of a lung. It's a volume above the residual volume at which the alveoli starts closing. During expiration, alveoli starts closing. So then we see how much is the volume left in the lung above the residual volume. Greater the closer volume, the less will be indicated about its obstruction. So we should then from we measure the closing capacity also. Then the diffusing capacity that the gases at what rate the gases are passing, particularly we are talking about oxygen, passing from the alveoli to the blood. It's the amount of oxygen which passes from the alveoli to the blood in a unit time, in a unit millimeter of mercury pressure gradient. So if there is a difference of one millimeter of mercury pressure gradient between the alveoli and the blood, and how much, how many milliliter of oxygen is passing in a unit time through the alveolar capillary pathway. That's called diffusion capacity. So it's a carbon monoxide is used for doing this thing. So it's about 31 mL of oxygen pass in a unit time from the alveoli to the blood under one millimeter mercury pressure gradient. 
If it is less, then we should think about what is the problem between the alveolar capillary pathway. If it is a fast, then again we should find out the reason why it is going fast. Right? It might be patient might be hypermetabolic state and is extracting the oxygen from there. Then there are some lung functions, non-uniform distribution of gases. I just enumerated nitrogen washout test, single breath test, oxygen inhalation method, then closing volume test, then xenon 133 inhalation test. Xenon is your inhaled, and then you see how quickly it passes through the alveoli and goes into the blood. Then test for non-uniform blood flow, that's angiograms, lung scanning, then lung scanning after injection of xenon 133. Then tests of uneven matching. In some part of the lung, there's uh, male distribution, but the blood flow is normal. In some region, there is a good distribution of gas, but there is shunting of the blood. For that purpose, that's called uneven matching. Evaluation of the total dead space and total shunt. You calculate it, and then from there, you can assess it. Then single breath carbon dioxide test. Then there's a difference in P and 2, partial pressure of nitrogen in the alveolar gas and partial pressure of nitrogen in the arterial blood. Then you see the difference. So there are so many tests, which the, might be in an advanced pulmonary unit, they might be doing it. Then unilateral lung function test, a, a one lung test, bronchospirometry, bronchoscopic gas sample, temporary unilateral pulmonary artery occlusion method, then intraoperative measurement of pulmonary artery pressure. Invasive is fluoroscopy, lateral position test, exercise test, xenon 133 radio spirometry, then macro aggregate of lung scanning. All these tests are done in the laboratories. Then there is locating the region of unknown matches. You find out which region is affected. Then xenon 133 test. You give by inhalation and you give by injection also. So these two will highlight which area is has got red space effect, which it has got shunting effect. Then there are some equations which are very important. Uh, we should know about it. That is VD over VT test. VD means red space in the lung, and VT means the area which is getting the gases, respiratory portion and the dead space portion. Always remember dead space to VT ratio is 0.3. About one third remains up to respiratory bronchial, then two third goes from respiratory bronchial up to the alveoli. So this is a normal, it's called anatomical dead space. Then there can be physiological dead space also. So if you know the PaCO2, partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood minus PeCO2, partial pressure of expired carbon dioxide divided by partial pressure of ox or carbon dioxide in the artery of blood, this will give you the ratio of VD or VT and it should be 0.3. Then partial pressure of oxygen in the or alveoli, that if you know the, at what pressure the oxygen is going into your lung, what is the pressure on your nose, on your mouth, how much is the pressure of oxygen, can you calculate it, how much is atmospheric pressure on you. 760 millimeter of mercury, we are at the sea level. Out of 760 millimeter of mercury, the water vapor PH2O, partial pressure of water vapor is 47. You subtract 47 from 760. How much is left? 730. Out of 730, 20% is oxygen. In air, you are breathing 20, 21%, 20%. So you 730 multiply with 20, divided by 100 because it's a person. So about 149, that is the partial pressure of oxygen at the nose. That's called PiO2, partial pressure of oxygen in the inspired gas. And the same PiO2 is going into the alveoli. Then carbon dioxide is coming from the blood in the same alveoli, it dilutes it. So that will give you, left, left pressure is called partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. So it means partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is equal to PiO2 minus carbon dioxide which has come 
they will have the same pressure as in the blood so paco2 partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood it's very easy to calculate then the shunt, shunt occasions how much blood is a coming in contact with the oxygen and how much just by passing it that is called shunting of blood so qs is the shunted blood qt is the total blood which is passing through the lung you calculate the uh, proportion for calculating age you need to know the quant cao2 minus ce cco2 over cvo2 minus cco2 and shunt equations now nowadays the computers they do automatically in olden days we used to calculate in my intensive care unit in nishar we used to calculate every day a gradient then a ratio then this shunt equation to find out how much is the gravity of problem in the lung and how can we correct it now this is a little bit of basics of respiratory physiology and anatomy now we go to that is acute respiratory distress syndrome now respiratory failure what is the definition of respiratory failure it is a, if the pulmonary system is no longer able to meet the metabolic demands of the body that is respiratory failure respiratory failure by just looking at the patient you can't say he is in respiratory failure if he can if he has if he is in we can't say he is in respiratory failure so we we'll have to look at the tissue level whether it is Uh, has got adequate effort to meet the demand of tissue or not if the respiratory system cannot meet the demands of, of the tissue it means the, the patient is in respiratory failure so so pulmonary system is very important you need to know six laws which apply to the lung one is gram's law of diffusion which i have told you already this is diffusion through the gaseous medium then henry's law of diffusion So this is the diffusion of gas in the liquid medium. Then Dalton's law of partial pressure. All these partial pressures which we measure, PiO2, PaO2, PaO2, all these things they are related to Dalton's law. So then Hagen-Poiseuille law. This is again related to pressure and flow. Pressure is directly proportional to pressure gradient, and then uh, viscosity and other things also. That's separate thing. Then Ohm's law. Ohm's law is nothing but it correlates the resistance with the pressure with the flow. There are three things you have to you need to know two things to find out the third one. Then the Laplace law. Laplace law is pressure is equal to two T over R, and this Laplace law is very important also. It is applicable on the heart chamber. It is applicable on the vessel. It is applicable on the urinary bladder. It is applicable on the alveoli also. And it depends where you want to apply it. P is equal to two T over R. Har ek the every thing has got different explanation. Right. So this is again separate topic. Now, to increase getting in oxygen, our objective is when we are breathing, or we are giving oxygen to any patient, our objective is to increase the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. forget about blood first our target is that partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli should increase p big ao2 how it is affecting it is affected by the alveolar pressure it is affected by carbon dioxide which is coming into the alveoli partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli that depends on the respiratory rate that depends on the vital uh, tidal volume that depends on the compliance volume per unit change in pressure then fio2 what is the concentration of oxygen which you are giving during inspiration fractional inspired oxygen concentration fio2 either you are giving 20% 25% 28% 35% or 100% then ventilation particularly irv is in is called inverse ratio ventilation if you want to increase the oxygenation in the alveoli you will have to increase the inspiratory phase so it's a ventilation pattern or mode you change changes in paco2 if the carbon dioxide is not coming out 
building up in the blood, it means it will be building up in the alveoli. In the alveoli, when the carbon dioxide comes, it exerts its pressure, which is called partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli, P, P big AO2. It is controlled by respiratory rate, how fast you are breathing or how fast you are ventilating and how much tidal volume you have got. If it is a greater tidal volume, it is easier to get rid of carbon dioxide. If it is a small volume, there is a chances of accumulation. Then ventilation perfusion mismatching, that whether the blood is coming equal to that uh, gas which is in the alveoli. Ventilation perfusion ratio matching is very important because normally when you breathe in, your minute volume is 6 liter. Out of 6 liter, 2 liter is left in the dead space. What you are left with is 4 liter. 4 liters come in contact with the blood where the gas is diffused. Carbon dioxide comes in and oxygen goes out. And how much is the blood which is coming into the lung per minute? 5 liters of blood. Whole cardiac output is, comes there. Whole blood volume passes through the lung in one minute. So 4 liters is the gas is coming over there in the alveoli and the 5 liters is the blood which is passing through the lung. So what is the 4 liters divided by 5 liters means 4 by 5 is 0.8. So ventilation perfusion ratio is 0.8. In a normal person, in a normal baby when it's born, we expect every both the lungs should have a ventilation perfusion ratio of 0 0.8. We also expect each lung should have a 0 0.8. We also expect each segment should have a 0 0.8. And we also expect every alveoli should be 0 0.8. Then we label it as the lung is normal. If there is a disturbance, it means either there is a ventilation problem or there is a perfusion problem. If there is more ventilation, then the blood which is coming over there, this is called dead space effect. If there is more blood coming as compared to gases, we call it shunting of the blood. So ventilation perfusion ratio in everywhere respiratory physiology or respiratory pathology. So you should have a concept of this ventilation perfusion ratio and then how to solve it out. That normally pulmonologists they divide failure into two types, hypoxemic failure and hypercapnic failure. Hypoxemic failure, they call type 1. Then type 2, we in intensive care, we don't divide like that. We only look at the blood gases. Now, in hypoxic failure, there could be decreased FiO2. You are guessing less oxygen. Inspired concentration of oxygen is less. Or ventilation, no perfusion. Might be there is a ventilation given to the lung, and which is not getting any adequate amount of blood. Then there is a perfusion, but no ventilation. In some part of, the part, part of the lung, blood is coming, but it's not being ventilated or it is consolidated. Then diffusion abnormality. There is a ventilation is normal, perfusion normal, but alveolar capillary pathway, alveolar epithelium, then capillary uh, interstitial space, then capillary endothelium, then is a plasma. There is some problem through this passage. Might be having intraalveolar edema, might be having interstitial edema, might be vessels closed, or might be the pulmonary vessels are open too much, or the vessels are constricted. So you will have to sort out alveolar capillary pathway in that way. So that causes hypoxemic failure. In a hypercapnic failure, patient might not be breathing adequately. Entirely depends on how fast the person is breathing, how many times per minute is breathing. Then whether the blood is being shunted through is or not, QS over QT ratio. So if the blood is not coming in contact, it's just bypassing the lung, so you cannot take up the, the carbon dioxide will accumulate in the, uh, in the blood and that will cause hypercapnia. That will take into respiratory failure, right? So these two things you will have to sort it out. Now clinically, in the respiratory failure, if you look at it, there should be signs of respiratory compensation. If the patient got into respiratory failure, there is bound to be tachypnea. What is tachypnea? Increase in respiratory rate. It doesn't mention about the tidal volume. So obviously, if the respiratory rate is increased, the tidal volume will be decreased. Decreased. Then use of accessory muscles. Always when you are assessing the respiratory system, stand on the foot end of the patient, 
and then observe the patient raise the head of the patient slightly 15 degree 20 degree 30 degree and then you stand on the foot and then watch how the patient is breathing so whether they are using excessive muscle or not if obviously the no excessive muscle look at the nose look at the alien nasi alien nasi if there is moving with inspiration and expiration it means the patient is in distress that gives you the early sign the patient is going into respiratory failure then increase sympathetic tone as there is hypoxia or hypercarbia, especially hypercarbia, that increase stimulates the sympathetic system. If you've got tachycardia with hypertension, and when the sympathetic system is stimulated, sweat gland, postganglionic sympathetic cholinergic fiber, they cause sweating. Postganglionic sympathetic cholinergic fiber, see, they cause sweating. So that will cause sweating if the patient's sympathetic system is stimulated and organ hypoxia. Brain will be affected. There will be altered mental state, right? Then gradually, if you don't correct hypoxia or if you don't correct hypercarbia, patient gradually goes into bradycardia. Then the blood pressure start dropping because hypoxia and hypercarbia both cause peripheral vasodilatation. Hypoxia and hypercarbia, they cause pulmonary vasoconstriction. Always remember this. They are going opposite to each other. Peripheral systemic circulation, they will cause vasodilatation. Pulmonary circulation, they cause vasoconstriction. Now to this patient, to patient is getting cyanose, and to this patient, if you start giving 100% oxygen, it will immediately raise the PO2, and it will cause, what will happen to pulmonary circulation? It will open the pulmonary circulation because hypoxia and hypercarbia has caused vasoconstriction. When you give 100% oxygen, it opens the pulmonary vessel. And sudden opening of pulmonary vessel, and as the peripheral vessels are already dilated, so sudden influx of oxygen there, which will cause influx of blood from the right heart into the pulmonary vessel and it will cause pulmonary edema. They go into pulmonary edema. Never ever correct with 100% immediately because this is called oxygen paradox. If due to hypoxia and hypercarbia patient, if you want to treat it, want to give oxygen, gradually increase the FiO2 so that gradually it should correct it. Otherwise they will go into pulmonary edema. This is called oxygen paradox. Hemoglobin desaturation, cyanosis. Gradually, what is cyanosis? Cyanosis is deoxygenated hemoglobin. And it has to be 5 grams or more than 5 grams before you get cyanosis. It means the person is anemic. There are less chances of having cyanosis as compared to the person who has got 15 grams or 16 grams of hemoglobin. So, the higher the hemoglobin, there are greater the chances of getting cyanosis lower the hemoglobin, there are lesser chances of getting cyanosis. Cyanosis is deoxygenated hemoglobin. Minimum should be 5 grams per 100 cc. And other terminology is met hemoglobin. What is met hemoglobin? The oxygen which is carried by hemoglobin, is it oxygenated or oxida oxi oxidized? This is oxygenation because oxygen just sits on the hemoglobin. Just like just a Rui ke rakhe hote wali sara rakhe hote char. So that is called oxida, oxi, oxygenated hemoglobin. When they undergo the chemical reaction, they become oxidized. They become oxidized. Now to treat the oxidized hemoglobin, which is called met hemoglobin, is an oxidized hemoglobin, you will have to reduce hemoglobin by giving a reducing agent, either vitamin C and something else. There are a few things which are being given, methylene blue, with that So you have to reverse the chemical reaction. So this phenomena of carrying oxygen by the hemoglobin is oxygenation, and the met hemoglobin is oxidized hemoglobin. Now, coming to ARDS now. Now, ARDS is refractory hypoxemia plus non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. If you go into the real pathophysiology of this, 
it's nothing but it is the refractory hypoxemia refractive means with ordinary methods of oxygen giving oxygen it does not correct and patient gets patient does not have any heart problem but goes into pulmonary edema it means it has to be bilateral it is not a unilateral we cannot say unilateral involvement lung as a ards it has to be bilateral